So with that, I'd like to, let's, con let's continue on. It's, it's my pleasure to introduce to all of you Beth Pendleton. Beth Pendleton is the Alaska Regional Forester at the U.S. Forest Service. She's worked in natural resources coast to coast for more than 25 years. She oversees management of more than 22 million acres of national forest system and the Tongass and Chugach, the two largest single national forests in the nation. She works closely with the region's diverse stakeholders and communities of interest, especially on issues related to forest restoration and strengthening rural community health. Beth and the U.S. Forest Service have been very supportive of this cluster work to date. Thank you very much. Beth. Well, good afternoon, I guess almost evening. It's good to see folks here, and, and Brian, thank you for the introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to join everyone at this year's summit as we bring together business, community, tribal, and government leaders uh, to work together to strengthen the economy of Southeast Alaska. In 2009, USDA directed the Forest Service, the Farm Service Agency, and Rural Development to work collaboratively toward creating jobs and healthy communities in Southeast Alaska. And over the last four years, there have been a number of advances that have been made around key economic initiatives due largely to the innovation and commitment of individuals in both the public and private sectors. And I think you've heard some of the amazing work that's been done to date. So as part of the USDA investment strategy, Rural Development, Farm Services Agency, and the Forest Service have supported the Juneau Economic Development Council to develop the cluster initiatives. And you've just heard from the cluster leads. Um, and we've also worked with JEDC to provide support initially for some asset mapping work that was done so that we could better recognize and understand the area's demographics and the current economic conditions. And we've worked uh, to build greater collaboration through last year's summit. I think this week is a, another great opportunity to do just that. But as I've been reflecting over the last couple of years and the work of the clusters in particular, um, I think one of the, the greatest um, take homes for me is that as we have participated as the Forest Service, and I'm speaking for the Forest Service now, but if, as we've participated with industry-led uh, clusters, um, we have really developed, I think, a greater understanding of how we can best uh, work with uh, industries. And I think you heard that from, from Kirby in particular with the visitor services. There were some very um, important and real connections that have occurred, even just here in Juneau with the Mendenhall Glacier Visitor Center and the opportunity to increase visitor use days. That's just one example. Also uh, with the visitor industries, the fee board and working with the fee board to identify and hear from customers and from our outfitter and guides and other service providers how we can best improve and provide services on the national forest system lands at our recreation sites. So there's been some wonderful opportunities and those are just a couple examples and I'll highlight a few more of how the Forest Service has gained, uh, gained a greater understanding and improved relationships in working with industry and getting a better understanding of needs. Sometimes it's as simple as sitting at the table and just communicating, working together and collaborating. So some good things, I think, coming out of the, the cluster initiatives. Um, a couple of other highlights. Um, the agency, you, you heard quite a bit from uh, Bob Deering, a, a, a significant investment that we're making is uh, bringing Bob on board to work with Dan Parent in our state and private forestry area and in working uh, and looking at an opportunity for developing a roadmap what is the potential in Southeast Alaska for biomass development? So we've made some commitments there, and this is very much to complement our hydroelectric energy supply here in Southeast Alaska. And the agency continues to work in that realm uh, as well. Um, I'll also mention uh, one other key area, and we have, um, I should mention, we have a number of staff here this week, so I hope you have the opportunity to interact, but. 
The uh, Forest Service, we're holding a regional team meeting this week, and um, as part of that, all of the directors and the regional office across all of our resource programs, as well as our forest supervisors are here and some other key staff. This is a great opportunity for folks to interact uh, across the state with the tribes, the business community, and others uh, in the week ahead. As we focus on in the, in the Forest Service, how we can strengthen our public-private uh, partnerships and initiatives um, across both Southeast and South Central Alaska. The last thing I wanted to mention before I introduce our, our speaker uh, this afternoon is the, the Forest Service and uh, the other USDA agencies have been working with the National Forest Foundation over the last couple of years to uh, provide for a community capacity and land stewardship program. And um, one of the things that we've also learned is uh, in many of our communities, the opportunity to, pro to provide some small C grants to help with uh, building some community collaborative capacity to help with some key forest restoration pro uh, projects, also to help provide for uh, technical assistance and training and stewardship coordination. So we've offered a couple of rounds of grants. We've awarded eight grants to communities uh, entities throughout Southeast Alaska to the tune of about $165,000. Uh, Karen Hardig, Karen, where are you? Raise your hand. Karen um, is helping and working with the National Forest Foundation uh, with that small grant program. And we're just uh, launching uh, the third round of the grant opportunities with applications uh, being accepted through March 5th of this year. Uh, we'll have some flyers out on the back table for those of you who are interested and may want more information on this, but this is a key aspect, is important with innovation, but sometimes those uh, small C grants are just what it is needed uh, in some of the communities and with small businesses to get a foot in the door. So, um, you know, in closing, I'm really looking forward to the next, um, this evening and uh, the next couple of days, uh, looking uh, forward to opportunities to interact with uh, those of you here and to see how we can um, work together and continue to work together around uh, economic development opportunities here in Southeast Alaska and across the state. So I applaud you for being here and uh, thank you for joining uh, this year's summit. So without further ado, I'm going to move on and I'm going to introduce um, our speaker um, this afternoon. It's my pleasure to introduce our, our guest speaker, Patrick Quinton. Uh, Patrick serves as the executive director for the Portland Development Commission, where he's responsible for the overall leadership and management of the city's economic development and urban renewal agency. In fact, he is known for his work in successfully transitioning the agency from a more traditional real estate uh, focused urban renewal agency to a jobs focused uh, economic development agency that has played a significant role in helping Portland emerge from the recession. Patrick is married with three children, and I understand this is your first trip to uh, Alaska, so let's not only welcome him as the speaker, but let's welcome him to the last frontier. Ladies and gentlemen, Patrick Quinton. <laughs> Thank you for that uh, introduction, Beth, and, and for the for the welcome, it is. It is. I'm. I'm. I'm ashamed to admit my first, my first time in Alaska. I promise you, it will not be my last. Um, and um, I also want to just uh, express my admiration for the for the Forest Service's commitment to this work. Um, it's it's um, it's truly wonderful, given someone who you know I spend my my days thinking about economic development and always looking for partners. And uh, to have a partner like the Forest Service with this work is, 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 like I said, really impressive. And um, being from Oregon, we also, the Forest Service plays a big role in our state. So, so thanks again for, for all of your work. Um, and I also just want to um, echo, um, I'm trying to think of the names, it's either Chris or, it was, I think it was Chris who was talking about the intrusiveness, I guess, or the, uh, I guess I'd say persistence of the JDC staff 
Um, it really is, uh, it takes a very persistent person to get me to, to come to leave Portland in February and come up to Juneau. Usually people who leave Portland in February go to Hawaii or Mexico. Uh, but Brian uh, truly is dedic so dedicated to this job that he, he convinced me to do this. But you do have a great team here. And I, um, once again, being in this profession and, and interacting with other economic development organizations around the country, just in the brief time that I spent with this group is, um, I can tell you have a very impressive team. And, and, and as I'm gonna get to in talking about Portland's experience, the, the, just what you see up here is also very impressive. It's, it's, it's half the battle is to get this kind of engagement in the process. And so you guys are, are, should congratulate yourselves for being this far along. Um, so, you know, my purpose here today is really to, to talk about the Portland experience. And uh, we are, you know, a bigger city and, and we get a lot of national attention and, and there are a lot of good things going on. I want to talk about that, but, you know, it's, it's, uh, we, we have our own set of lessons, uh, good and bad, and so I, I want to make sure to share, to share both uh, with you today. But it really is meant to be on the ground probably maybe a year or two ahead of, of, of where you're at, and so we can talk about some of, of the accomplishments, uh, but also you know, where, where we're headed um, next on this. I am going to start by giving you a little overview of the agency that I run, just so you can get a bit of context for the, for the journey that we've traveled. Uh, the, the city of Portland has not always been as explicitly focused on economic development or, or the region for that matter. And so the fact that we're even uh, being invited to events like this to talk about economic development is, is an achievement for us. So I want to spend a little time talking about that and then I'll dive into to the, to the, to the work that we've done that's most relevant to what you're doing. And I have to say, once again, that what Brian just did in the intro makes it a lot easier for me to talk about our work because he, you know, the, the theory that he laid out for you is really the best practice theory that, 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 that we looked at and adopted years ago. And it's, um, it's what a, a lot of cities around the country and, and, and around the world are doing. Um, and then uh, we do have some results to talk about and I'd like to share those with you. Um, some of them are macro level results, so we don't take all the credit for those, but uh, we do think some, some good things are happening in Portland. And hopefully if, with Marie's help, I can leave some time for questions. Um, so first, I, uh, about Portland, uh, sorry, my, this is a presentation I use other places, and so I have only have the continental map. I actually did look around for a quick copy of the, of the, you know, with Alaska in, but you guys know where we are. So, um, but next time I come, I'll bring a better map. Um, so, you know, Portland is a, is a, you know, pretty typical mid-sized city, about, you know, 22nd, 23rd largest city. Uh, what's interesting about us is that our city itself is about the same size as Seattle population wise, but because our metro area is much smaller, we're about a million people fewer than Seattle. But, you know, we end up uh, size wise in our MSA being around places like Sacramento and Cincinnati and, and places like that. We don't, we think of ourselves as being uh, bigger than that, but that's a uh, size wise. We, we certainly aspire to be more like cities like Seattle and, and San Francisco and Denver. Um, we, uh, um, you know, we, we, our, our economic output is, puts us right squarely in, in that category as well. So even though we'd like to be punching above our weight, we, we still have some, some work to do. But as I'll get into in a second, we, we do have leadership in some areas that we're well known for, particularly, uh, we like to ride bikes a lot, um, even in the rain too. Um, our economy does have some interesting attributes to it that make it a little bit, um, uh, unique. We uh, uh, we are one of the metro areas that are that are growing. Um, so we we expect to add a million new residents to the metro area over the next roughly 20 years. Uh, for a metro area that has about 2.2 million people, that's a lot. Um, we are, and so you know that's that poses a lot of challenges. But certainly we need to create jobs. Second thing is that we are one of the most um, heavily concentrated. Or I always trip up trying to say this. We have one of the highest concentrations of small businesses of any major metro area in the country. Um, so I think it's like top five, meaning that we have a lot of small businesses and very few big businesses, and that impacts how you grow your economy. Uh, but some of the good, you know, some of the positive things that are happening, and you know, or things that I don't think are challenges that are real assets, and is that we're very trade dependent. And if you go back to the previous map, you guys have the same same advantage that we do. We're on the Pacific Ocean, so we. We really do have always had a trade orientation, and so we we uh, we consistently um, uh, exceed kind of the national average in terms of trade. And then we also um, 
uh, do have a, a pretty well-established concentration of clean tech jobs, and it is one of the clusters we talk about. Um, in terms of the city of Portland, um, and once again, this is just background as we talk about our cluster work, we don't have, like I said, we don't have a lot of large companies. So you look on, on this list, these are, these are the largest employers in the city of Portland. Not many uh, names you recognize, certainly you recognize Adidas. That's the North American headquarters of Adidas, not the, you know, the, that company's based in Germany. Um, the company to the right, Precision Cast Parts, is one of the two Fortune 500 companies that actually is headquartered in the metro area. And the rest of them you can see are, you know, hot, uh, healthcare, university, banks. When your major employers are healthcare providers or financial institutions, that does, it's not really a, an unusual um, economy. But what we do have in our region are three incredible drivers. And so part of our strategy is to take advantage of that. And so first, we have the highest, the highest number of Intel employees anywhere on the planet. So you know, their headquarters are in California, but we have all their manufacturing operations, and they've continued to grow and invest in the metropolitan area throughout the recession. We, of course, have Nike, and they are the other Fortune 500 company that's headquartered um, in, in our region. And then the, the other company is smaller, uh, but still very recognizable a brand, uh, Columbia Sportswear, and, and I'll get to in a second talking about our clusters, how these two companies really are cornerstones of, of our um, economic development strategy. And so that's the overview, and now I just want to talk a little bit about our agency, and in particular, I want to talk about our journey, and I'm going to run through it really quickly. I'm going to kind of sprint through 50 years of history through photos uh, just to show you, and, I, and I've had the pleasure of, of a few earlier meetings today about, and, 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 and um, some, some of the meetings revolved around this history here. There are folks who were interested in our, our efforts around redevelopment and downtown development, so you'll see some of that. But we really did start as an urban renewal redevelopment agency, which means we were concerned about about development, you know, investment in, in buildings and infrastructure, and it took us a long time to move from that to the to the current path we're on. But we started in the late 50s um, as the um, an urban renewal agency, and um, we are an independent uh, body, a government body. We we work very closely with the city of Portland and the city council, but we do have an independent budget and operations, and our work is historically and continues to be primarily funded by something called tax increment financing and I don't want to you know dive into the kind of the the nuances of of this but it's a very particular type of financing that in one respect allows us to do big projects but it doesn't give us a lot of money to do um, the kind of soft work that that the work that you that's that was talked about earlier the, the intensive staff work and the work directly with businesses but it really it did influence how we how we did our work and so in 1958, we, we were formed to do urban renewal, and urban renewal, for those of you who, are, who have studied public policy, was the, you know, people looked around at cities and saw these rundown buildings and neighborhoods, and they said, let's tear them down and let's build skyscrapers and clear it all out and create plazas. Um, and, and so that's how we got our start. And you know, anytime you see a photo of middle-aged men in suits swinging hammers, it can't be a good thing. Um, and, and, it, and it wasn't. Um, it, it, they took neighborhoods that really were some of the kind of richest ethnic neighborhoods in the city of Portland, and they tore them down and created scenes like this, which actually to this day still exist, um, but they, they've turned out to be some of the, the deadest parts of our downtown, and we're, people are now doubling back to try and figure out how to make these spaces more, more alive. But thankfully, we began to figure out a better way um, and so we, we, uh, we started doing things like we ripped up the highway uh, that, that ran along our river. This is the Willamette River. And somebody said, hey, let's, let's put a park there. And so we put a park there. So we ripped out a highway and put a park. Um, we um, took a large parking lot right in the middle of downtown, and we turned it into um, a public plaza, which for those of you who have been to Portland, this is the heart of Portland. This is what we refer to affectionately as our living room. Pioneer Courthouse Square, and it's where we have festivals. It's where all the Max trains cross, and so it's 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 now a kind of vibrant part of the of the city. We turned a uh, polluted uh, a site along the river, and and the river itself was polluted, and we turned it into a marina and a award-winning mixed-use development. Um, we built downtown uh, shopping malls, and uh, we we built now on the other side of the river, and I got a walking tour today, and. 
somebody showed me the, the, the riverfront walkway and how there's plans to keep, to keep extending it. So we actually built on the opposite side of the river from where the highway used to be, opposite from downtown, what we call the esplanade, but it's a, it's a promenade that extends from one, from one end of downtown, facing downtown to the other. And what was unique about it was what's, what literally is right here is I-5, the highway that runs from Mexico to Canada. So that wasn't going anywhere, and we couldn't tear that highway up. So this, this esplanade is almost entirely built on, on basically nothing. It's built on water. It's built into the side of, of you know, the, the embankment there. So it really was an architectural achievement as well as a design achievement. And what it's done is it's created a full loop around our river downtown and activated that. And, and it gives people a homely view of our downtown. We also did industrial development and commercial development. It's hard to tell from this, these pictures, but, but on, on, uh, this is really the, airport or the area around our airport. And in this, in this photo here, we, this was all vacant land, and we turned this into um, a commercial center. And there's actually light rail now running all the way to the airport uh, as a result of that work. So if you've ever taken, flown into Portland and taken the train into downtown, the, the, the light rail was, a res was actually built privately as a result of, of this development. And then, of course, we, we built Streetcar, and people, a lot of people know about Streetcar. This is one of the most iconic locations in the city for Streetcar because the Streetcar line runs right through the center of our, of our Portland State University campus, right underneath one of our buildings. So this is now one of the most popular spots um, downtown. We built a Chinese garden right in the middle of our downtown to honor our Chinese heritage. We, we, uh, we, we along with a lot of other private developers, helped build what is now called the Pearl District, one of the uh, most vibrant areas, uh, downtown neighborhoods in the, in the, in the country, and, and now an increasingly attractive employment district. Um, more recently, we took the area south of downtown, which was a brown, basically a brownfield former ship, ship yard, and then, and then they, they actually took apart ships after the war there, and it's now um, developing into one of the densest neighborhoods in the city, uh, modeled a lot after what's going on in Vancouver, BC and will be the, the site of future growth of uh, downtown employment as well. We did a lot of work in our neighborhoods, too, too much to, to go through in this amount of time, but um, a lot of physical redevelopment of commercial uh, districts in our, in our, in our neighborhoods. Um, and so what, what happened as a result of that is that we, you know, we got to a period of about, about five years ago, and we... Um, had created what was now nationally recognized as an, as, a, as an incredible place to live. The quality of life, um, our quality of life reputation was kind of off the map, off the charts, and, and um, uh, people were flocking here, and um, we also developed an incredible reputation for sustainability and, and getting ahead of the game in terms of green policy. And so we developed this this place where, where everybody thought this was Nirvana and, and everybody wanted to move here. And in fact, we started to get this massive influx um, of, of residents. And, and the, the history I just walked through there is, 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 has, has a lot to do with that. We, we actually played a big role in creating this incredible place. But what was also going on was we, had, we hadn't really addressed the fundamentals of the economy. I don't know how many people in the room here watch Portlandia. Do you have any Portlandia fans? So this is, this was the one of the, this was the opening um, episode of Portlandia. Basically, this song that talked about Portland as the dream of the uh, the '90s. Basically, you could go back to the '90s uh, by moving to Portland, and they had the line where young people go to retire, and it and it was a joke. But 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 those of us living in Portland knew it it kind of to be the case that that we had a lot of people moving to Portland, a lot of young people moving to Portland, and most of them were either unemployed or underemployed living on couches, and the Wall Street Journal actually wrote an article about people in Portland living on each other's couches. Um, and so we felt like, you know, this place, this place is great. There's, there's the, the, the place aspect is all there, but we actually have to do something. We have to address some fundamentals in the economy. Um, and for the first time, we began to look really hard at, at what was going on in the economy, and we had never really developed a fully functioning, diversified economy. We like you, actually, uh, for, for many years, the state of Oregon um, was a resource-dependent economy, and Portland was its, its capital, was, it, was a, the center of the timber industry in, in Oregon. So the money that, 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 that came out of the timber industry 
really went into the city of Portland, and that's what created the institutions there. That's why the financial institutions were there. That's what the, the, the attorneys and accountants and others lived on. And when that industry went away, we, were left, we weren't really left with much to stand on. And, and, uh, and when banking consolidation happened, the, the banks that were headquartered in Portland left. And we were really left without a diversified economy, and we needed to begin to think about a transition to a, a more diversified economy. And so for the first time in 2008, we said we need to, we need to develop an, an economic development strategy for real, not one based on real estate development, but one based on job creation. And, and we said the quali quality of life that we have developed here is only one aspect of it. We really have to build an economy based on fundamentals. And so we, we went through this process, and this slide here is actually a four-year-old slide that we developed to, 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 to have conversations like this about how we had to go about building our, our strategy and quality of life, the progressive values, the green living, all that stuff was only one half of it. We actually had to, to, to explicitly think about what it is that helps businesses succeed and, and grow jobs. And so we created this vision to create this, the most sustainable economy in the world, but I can talk about what that means in a second. But this, this was the first time we'd ever formally acknowledged that we needed to do something explicitly about job creation. And so this was the fancier graphic that we developed later on. But we basically put in place a strategy that, that had three different, three different facets to it. Um, one was, and the main one was, in the orange circle, what we call maximizing competitiveness. And that's really our traded sector strategy, and I'll get to that in a second, because that's really the focus of, of this presentation. The green circle was about how do we take the real estate investments that we make and really tailor them so that they promote job creation. And the third one was about, about neighborhoods, and we're still a city of neighborhoods. We're a fairly large urban, urban area, and we have neighborhoods that will always have needs that go beyond the traded sector economy, and so we had a very explicit neighborhood strategy. And we said we wanted to create 10,000 net new jobs in five years. And that was saying we want to see the economy grow by 10,000 jobs in five years, and, and truly I was there, part of this. We picked that number kind of out of thin air, but we wanted a nice round number. We wanted a number of people to remember, so 11, 10 was better than 11,000. So it didn't have a lot of science to it, but we had looked back and thought over five-year periods, looking back, when have we ever grown by 10,000 jobs? And we really couldn't find many. So we said, that's a decent goal. Everybody can remember it. Let's grow the economy by 10,000 net new jobs. And so as I mentioned, at the core of it was growing the traded sector economy. And you know, Brian did the kind of fundamentals here, but, and I'll just return to him even more basically than that the traded sector economy is the part of the economy that makes goods and services that you sell outside the region. It can be outside the country, but the only way you actually grow an economy is by actually bringing dollars into the economy. I know it all sounds basic, but in Portland at the time and probably other places, people didn't necessarily get that. They didn't necessarily, they thought, our, our mayor was famous for saying at the time, we can't grow economy by selling beer and coffee to each other. And that's, and that's how a lot of people thought of the economy at the time was, it's great, look at all the brew pubs are opening and all the coffee shops, what, you know, what's wrong? Well, what's wrong was we weren't, we weren't really expanding the economy. So the traded sector part of the economy is, is, is what needs to be grown in order to grow the economy. That creates wealth that then flows in through the service sector, the retail sector. And so we, we had to basically beat this drum over and over again. It's traded sector, it's the traded sector that matters. So we. So we, we got that across, but we also, and, and, and this is where we got into clusters, and I'll, and, I'll, and I'll get into that in a second, but we also said a couple other points. We're only going to grow a diversified, stable economy if we grow our own. So the entrepreneurship aspect of it and the innovation aspect of it was key. So it wasn't, this wasn't a recruitment strategy. This was, this was how do you grow your own strategy, and we also knew that if we were going to create a traded sector economy, that we actually had to get better at trade. And so we, we, we knew we had to have an explicit international trade piece of it, and we actually, we actually um, do have that, that now. And then, of course, as, been, as has been mentioned up here, it needs to connect back to jobs and to the people that live here and to how, people, um, how we can make sure that the jobs that are created in, in our traded sector economy actually go to people who live here. So that was the, the basic strategy that, that we undertook. And at the heart of it was, was clusters. And Brian did the, the great um, overview, like I said, and you know, Michael Porter is the godfather of clusters and the, and the whole thing. And so it really is, um, it's, try, it's a tried and true methodology. 
But what I would say is, and, and um, there, there, there are still different, different opinions about how you go about this. And what I'll, what I'll say is from our perspective, this was about establishing priorities. So we can have a great robust conversation about how do you pick a cluster, who picks a cluster, do you pick clusters or do clusters just, just happen on their own? But for us, it was fundamentally an organizing principle. How do we align resources? How do we come together around a common terminology and say we're going to accomplish these, these five things or whatever? And what you saw up here is the perfect example. You could put, pick any name for the industry that was up there, but what you saw was a group of people who outlined their priorities for the year. That in and of itself is a strategy, and that actually is how you get things done. You're not spending all your time arguing over what else you should be doing. You're, 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 you're establishing your priorities. You're not trying to be all things to all people. And, you know, the, the, and then the other thing I'll just add to that is when we went about picking clusters in, in, in Portland, people came out of the woodwork and said, well, what, you know, how can you pick these clusters? Why pick clusters? Why not just be open to any business? And, and, um, and I said, my response to people was always, if we don't, if we aren't proactive, we're going to be picking winners and losers. We're just not going to be the ones picking them. We're going to have the per first person that calls us is going to be the person that gets uh, the company that gets selected. That's not a strategy, I can tell you that. We can pick another, we can have another way to pick companies. But if you're just open for business and everybody can call you, you're, you're, you're actually going to be picking winners, winners and losers. You're just not going to have any rationale for doing it other than who, who picks up the phone first. So, so part of this was really just let's have a strategy, let's have priorities. When we dove into the cluster analysis, though, we really did try and make it you know, a rational process. And so when you, when you look at do cluster analysis, these criteria usually come up. And a lot of it is around these things like location quotients and whatnot. But it really means what's here, what's here in concentrations above what you would see anywhere else in the country. So that, that should be a reflection of your strengths. Um, so obviously your, your ocean products industry, right? You're, there, there, there's an obvious case to be made. This is an industry that is more concentrated here than in most other parts of the country. So there's a str strong rationale already for working with that. So that's, it's just kind of basic logic put into economic theory. But there has to be, in addition to that, there has to be fundamental competitive advantages that you know are lasting, that not, aren't just based on kind of artificial barriers to entry. And there has to be potential for real growth. So um, we had industries that, that showed up really high in our local economy, very highly concentrated, but they weren't going anywhere. These weren't industries that are going to be growing. So we had to, had to you know, find the industries that had both significant advantages and concentrations and had an opportunity for growth. And then I think the last thing is, will they create family wage jobs? So we, we have a lo an ongoing debate within our community around the food industry. Um, we have, um, uh, we have a reputation now around the country as being a foodie city, a lot of restaurants, but also a lot of craft foods, a lot of locally grown foods. I mean, really, it's, it's great. I mean, it's a really great place to be in that regard. And so we keep being, getting asked, why isn't food one of our clusters? And I'll get to what our clusters are. And what we always say is most of the jobs in the food industry don't really pay that well. So if we're going to spend a lot of time growing an industry, we'd like to grow an industry that actually can pay family wage jobs and actually can then have a multiplier effect that drives the rest of the economy. And I think until food can, get, can change that dynamic, we're not going to be able to, to um, bring it into our, our list of clusters. So these are our four clusters. Um, and I'm going to get into each of them in a second, kind of what we're doing. Um, I think they probably feel a little obvious based on what I've told you already. Um, so clean tech and athletic and outdoor, um, you know, I think I've kind of talked about our, our history there. Manufacturing, though, it's worth noting that we still have one of the highest concentrations of manufacturing jobs on the West Coast. So cities like Seattle and San Francisco have, haven't really maintained the same concentration. It's still manufacturing, but we have a much higher percentage of our jobs in manufacturing. L.A. still has a big manufacturing base. So it's, it's, you know, it's not whether we work with manufacturing. It's, it's, it's what happens with manufacturing and, and how we can, can help our manufacturers succeed. And then the, the last one is software, and that one for us became kind of a, a strategy differentiating ourselves from the region in that we had Intel anchoring the regional economy. Intel's, what Intel has in, in the region is a high-tech manufacturing operation. They're stamping out chips and things like that. Incredible 
uh, industry, uh, incredible driver of wealth within our region. But what was happening in Portland wasn't manufacturing. It was pe people moving there and starting um, so software companies, people from Intel, other high-tech companies as programmers and things like that. And so we decided to make ours very, very narrowly focused on software as opposed to tech. And it's actually paid off quite well. The last thing before I get into each of our clusters is the, the fact that we picked four was a huge deal as well. I can't mean, there's some simple little stories that come out of putting together a strategy. The notion at the beginning of our process that we would have only picked four, I think, you know, I basically report to the Portland City Council in some respects, five people. They would, if I told them we would come out with four, they would have fired me before we even started. The notion that you're gonna say yes to four and no to every single, every other industry was that, was, that was incredibly foreign to them. We've had strategies in the city of Portland in the past where we had 12 target industries or 12, whatever you wanted to call them back then. And, and one of my basic philosophies is if you can't staff it, like if I can't provide staff for an industry, then I can't, then I can't call it a cluster. It doesn't mean that, that, they, that work isn't going on, but I can't legitimately say I have a strategy that, that, that addresses that industry if I'm actually not working in it. So you know, one of my basic rules of thumb is, is and I have a decent sized organization, so I know JADC probably wants to get there, but, but we can actually do this. I'm, if I can't put at least one, one full-time person on a cluster, if not more, then it shouldn't be a cluster. So that was a necessary constraint on it, but it truly was a way for us to, and, and, you know, and I operate in a political environment, so it gave us a rationale to say no as much as it did drive what we did, kind of the yeses, because, because the, the, the ability to say no is a really important thing to have when you're trying to focus on, on the things that matter, being able to say no to the things that, are, that, that aren't priorities is also really important. So, so to get through four was, was a big deal for us and thankfully we were able to convince our leadership that that was the right way to go. So quickly you know, run through, you guys just saw a, bu a bunch of action plans and it's no different. These are, these, this is what we did, we sat down with the industry, we have very different um, um, kind of industry forums, I guess if you will, across our different clusters and, and we haven't tried to, to enforce a single organizing structure on them. So like clean tech doesn't really have a formal advisory committee, uh, software does, but, and so we, but we've had a lot of community conversations as you, can, as you guys saw from, from, from your colleagues up here. Um, but th these are the main actions that we have taken or are taking. So the first, on clean tech, we started out as a leader, in, viewed as a leader in clean tech. We, we, for the longest time, we're the, we're the city with the most green buildings, the most LEED certified buildings. We still are the most per capita. There's cities that have built more buildings than us just because they, have, they, build, they build a lot more than we do. But we still have the recognized expertise around the world for green buildings. We also have the highest concentration of, of clean energy professionals, you know, managers of any city. We, we like this to, to view ourselves as the, the Houston of the clean energy business. And so we, we have companies that manage wind farms and the insulation wind farms and other forms of clean energy. BPA, which is the Bonneville Power Administration, they, they manage the hydro power in the Columbia region, the Columbia River Basin. Um, significant energy professional presence. So we, had a, we, we already had this head start and one of our goals was to maintain it. So when we thought about the companies that we wanted to bring in, that's a big driving force for us. Second thing was we wanted to to, and you'll see this on the manufacturing side, we wanted to, to look at national companies, big companies in clean tech and figure out how we could take our smaller companies and put them into the supply chain. Third, we, we wanted to be the, 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 the city that was the, the early adopter of new technologies. For a while there, every time a company wanted to demonstrate an electric vehicle, they came to Portland to do it. They weren't making them in Portland, but, but when you know Ford or Chevy Volt or, um, um, the, the Nissan Leaf, all these other, they all came to Portland to test, to test their vehicles, to find early adopters. That was because we had a reputation for that and that once again helped on our, on our brand. And then the last one really is kind of around our brand is we, we felt it was necessary for us to intervene and really promote what was going on so that our companies could benefit globally from, from the reputation that we had. And so that's a big, a big, uh, 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 strategy within our export plan, you'll see that as well. Software, very different uh, dynamic. 
very collaborative industry, very community driven. They basically wanted us to, to convene meetings and get out of the way, and we did that. And so the picture you see up there is the, the software industry packed the chambers of our city council um, and had a community meeting there. And so it's not us leading the meeting, it's actually software, software industry folks having a conversation about where they wanted to go. So they started out with this, this kind of collaborative effort called PDX11. It's actually since fizzled out a little bit, but because they've actually then moved on now to very specific initiatives um, that, are, that are focused on um, you know, talent, talent adoption or, or, or attraction, um, helping each other with new technologies. Um, we've we've um, spent a lot of time thinking about how to turn over government data. You see this in other cities. So that they call them civic apps. So that, you know, how do you use open source and, and, and other technologies to make city publicly available data accessible to people on their smartphones and whatnot. So, so we've done a lot of that. And then we've just spent a lot of time thinking about our startup ecosystem, and that's greatly benefited our software industry. On advanced manufacturing, um, you know, we started with a, a um, the, the real concentrations in Portland around metals manufacturing, transportation manufacturing. We have, we have a legacy history of shipbuilding. I showed you that in one of our earlier pictures. We still have companies making barges. We have companies that repair ships. Um, and then we also have companies that make rail cars and other things. So basically what we have is we have companies and a supply chain that know how to make big things out of metal. Um, and so we are, we've now transitioned to making streetcars. So the first US made streetcars, I think in 50, 60, 70 years are being made right in Portland. They're, they, uh, they're the streetcars that we have, but there's the streetcars that are being purchased by the other cities around the country that are doing streetcars. Um, and, and we're trying to find other places for, the, for these type of companies to use their expertise. And then we're using our resources to help them operate better. So we're, we're, we're helping them expand in our enterprise zone. We're getting, giving them access to lean manufacturing and, and waste reduction strategies. We're trying to find places, increase the land supply for them to expand as well. So the manufacturing strategy is, as you'll see, it's, it's, it really is, it's not the high growth employment strategy because manufacturing itself is, is actually becoming more capital intensive, but it is about making our main, the companies we have more profitable, more productive, and, and, and allow them to continue to, to, to make investments here in Portland. And then the last one is our athletic and outdoor action plan, and, and I'll show you something in a second that's gonna highlight this point, but this is one of the most traditional clusters you will see anywhere in the world. So the, the, the traditional cluster theory has the big companies in the middle, and they're the anchors, and little companies spin off from those from the big companies. Talent leaves, and 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 uh, either uh, supplies those companies, starts their own companies. There's supply chain. There's there's sharing of ideas and innovation. Um, that's what happens in our region. So we didn't pick a, We didn't definitely didn't pick winners and losers in this one. This one existed, and 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 we've just been thinking about you know you know 24/7. How do we help this industry grow? And it's not just how do we help Nike grow or Adidas grow or Columbia grow. It's how do we help all these companies around it grow. And you can see this is an industry of brands. And so we, we, we're very conscious of, of what their needs are. And their needs are really around how do they attract talent? How do they make sure that they have the environment to have the most competitive designs? And, and we've also, and we were talking about this earlier today in another meeting, how do we make sure that there's the creative capacity around them the advertising capacity and the other promotional capacity in the ecosystem to allow them to promote their brands. This is not a manufacturing play for us, unfortunately, right? These things are all manufactured in Asia, elsewhere. There's some onshoring that's beginning to happen, but for the most part, manufacturing occurs else, elsewhere. But this is the knowledge aspect of this industry, and it's and it's really quite successful. And so, so one of the things that we did with this industry was was to show them, and in particular show Nike and Adidas and Columbia, you're a cluster. You really depend on each other. You exist because of each other. The small companies got it, but Nike never thought of it that way, probably didn't want to think of itself that way because they, they like to keep their, you know, their trade secrets to themselves and their talent to themselves. But it really was an incredibly functioning cluster, and they, didn't, they really didn't recognize it. And so we, we undertook a study to show them uh, what was going on and then use it as a, as a marketing tool for the industry. And so we created this incredibly cool poster. This is actually a poster. Um, 
And for, for, for cluster geeks, this is like, you know, one of the, you need to have this on your wall. This is, so this is, and, and we actually have an earlier version that we, we didn't do, but uh, was done of our high tech cord, or we could call it Silicon Forest. Everything has to have silicon, but, but um, that one looks like a real map of the galaxy, you know, so it looks like, you know, big companies and all the companies. This, we, we hired the same person and they came up with a completely different graphic that still has a ton of information. So this is whatever you want to think about it. It's bubbles, buttons, whatever, but it, but it, it has going up this axis, this is time, right? So, so this is the earliest companies and moving up to the most current companies. So this basically tracks their, their year of formation and then size obviously matters. And then within this, you have different colors that show different connections, what they do, and also their connections to the big three. So the big three, this is Columbia, this is Nike, and this is Adidas, which, which came into the Portland market. They basically took two Nike executives and came into the Portland market um, and, and formed their thing here. So there are now 300 companies that are they're all listed over here on this. On That's why the poster helps. Um, uh, but these are, but you can see just, the, the increase in activity in terms of startup, and this is, this is old now, but just the, the number of companies that have been created in basically the past five years in the Portland market, I mean, it's probably, could be close to a third to a half of the companies that exist in this cluster. So there's this incredible momentum around, around the way clusters operate. So this is really, and, and now Brookings and others have studied this cluster. This is one of the, the poster child, like I said, for, 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 uh, for cluster work. And, and we just get to kind of be the beneficiaries of this great, this great um, cluster because companies now come all the time to Portland and say they want to be here because there's just no other place to be. If you're in this business, this is where the talent is. This is where the capital flows. This is where the retailers go. It's because retailers take, you know, they buy your product. This is where you have to be. So we're, we, just, we, just, we, we just take the phone calls and help them find space and we don't really have to do much convincing at all. So then a couple of last points on our, on our cluster work. We have spent, and I was noticing it here, there's, there's a lot of substantive kind of on the ground work that you can do with clusters and, and that's great. And I think it's the really heavy lift, particularly when you're, when you're taking companies from seed to mature clusters. We now, we view our role, particularly on the public side, as, as trying to take what are mature clusters and really promote them. And we promote them for different reasons. We promote um, the, the, the clean tech industry because we want the companies that that are in Portland that may not have nationally known names to be able to 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 say to go into a, a a mayor's office in China and say, yeah, I'm from Portland, and they say, oh, Portland, that's right, Green City. You guys are the ones who know how to do it. If it's athletic and outdoor industry, we want to promote it because we want to make sure everybody around the country realizes that they're in the wrong city and they should be in our city. So we we promote for different reasons, but we actually came came across a single unifying theme for our four clusters. And it really started with this. We, we developed this branding campaign called We Build Green Cities. And this is what we use now to sell our, our green industry so they can use this collateral material in addition to their own to sell their expertise. And, and behind this is a whole marketing campaign, brochures, list of companies, different capabilities. But it's clean tech, it's We Build Green Cities. In, in software, it's we create what's next. We actually have another brand, just to confuse things, called Techlandia, Portlandia, Techlandia. Um, and uh, we do this in, 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 uh, in collaboration with the um, Technology Association of Oregon. Uh, so this is partly their branding strategy as well. For athletic and outdoor, we think outside. And then for manufacturing, we forge the future. So we now have four unified marketing campaigns that we can use for different purposes, but companies that are in our clusters can use to go out to the, to the outside world and sell what they do. And then I mentioned we, uh, we wanted to make good on this notion about traded sector economies have to be really good at trade. So because of our cluster work, we actually got chosen by the Brookings Institution as being one of four metro areas to, de to develop what they call a metro export plan. Brookings Institution feels very strongly that the metro economies are the ones that, that that's, that's, that's the, 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 
the component of the economy we should be focused on because economies don't operate on state levels or even national levels. It's really metros that, that drive economic growth around the world. So they wanted people to think from a metro scale and they want export strategies at a metro scale. So we got their help to develop our first metropolitan-wide export plan. So we now have, a, have, a, have an explicit action plan to grow exports from the businesses that are actually in our economy right now, which once again, from our perspective, never really happened. People thought about it, how do we get more goods in and out of our port or, or various measures of trade as opposed to what we really wanted, which was just to grow exports from our companies. So we now have a very explicit strategy on that. The cluster framework, though, allows us to create a focus and alignment around that. So I couldn't execute this strategy, an export strategy, broadly speaking. I, I, I would have to have some other way to organize it. Thankfully, we already had the cluster framework to do that, and that's why Brookings chose us as well, is because they knew we were ready to take the next step on that. And then the other aspect of it is around entrepreneurship. So we spent a lot of time thinking about how do we grow the entrepreneurship ecosystem in Portland. In fact, initially quite independent from our cluster work. So I had people doing cluster work and I had people doing entrepreneurship work. And the entrepreneurship stuff was great. It was really taking off. We were beginning to more startup activity. A lot of it was technology based. But it was a separate activity. And then we began to find enough instances where this stuff overlapped. And so and this is all just kind of examples of some of the work we're doing around entrepreneurship. But we said, well, wait a minute. These aren't different activities. Once again, if we're going to grow our own, there's companies that exist within our clusters that we want to grow now. And there's companies that we want to start within our, within our, our clusters. So we began to then think of basically took our cluster framework and our work in clusters and turned it a, di a different way and said, how are we supporting entrepreneurship within clusters? It's not different work. It's just a little different twist on it and thinking about, you know, are, we, are, there, are there ways for us to grow the startup rate within clean tech or athletic and outdoor? Are there ways for us to help small companies within these the clusters scale? Nike doesn't really need our help to grow, but there's lots of small little companies in that, in, in that industry that need our help. And, and what they need looks a lot like what a software company needs early on. They need access to capital. They need access to senior level talent. They need mentors who can help them think through some of these issues as they scale. So these are all issues that affect your clusters. It's not just a kind of general startup thing. So maybe it seems obvious to everybody, you know, when you talk about it that way, it, it didn't occur to us right away to merge the two. But now a lot of what we do around clusters really is entrepreneurship work. It's around developing the ecosystem for entrepreneurs. And then the last thing before I just sum it up is um, this, you know, we're in the city of Portland. So if, for those of you who know, the city, I mean, city of Portland, like I said, about 600,000 people. We're in a region of about 2.2 million people. So there's a lot of region beyond just us. We cover two states. Vancouver, Washington sits across the river from us and, and, uh, and, and, and they're part of our region basically. So you know, a strategy, and, and once again, economies operate on metro scales. They don't operate on city, they don't stop at the borders. So how does this play out to the metro area? And thankfully, we have great partners at the state and our, so Business Oregon is our state uh, economic development agency. Uh, Greater Portland Inc. is our regional metro, it's like the JDC of Portland. It's a private, privately funded metropolitan level economic development organization. And then our private sector, our purely private sector folks, that, like the Chamber of Commerce, they developed what they call the Value of Jobs campaign, which was a whole nother, more of a study, but, but basically to put out the message of traded sector jobs are the drivers of the economy that we need to focus on this if we're going to have, uh, if we're going to create jobs for people at, you know, at all income levels and if we're going to raise tax revenues for the government. So, so all of us got into alignment around, around this strategy. We didn't start out that way. We didn't, we didn't all sit in a room like this and come together, but we each independently came together and we all picked the same clusters after, you know, we, we, we eventually came together and said, let's make sure that we're in a line. We're aligned around that. So we all have the same clusters. We basically have a regional strategy that mirrors a strategy I just laid out and, and the private sector is now fully engaged um, on that. They're fully engaged on the fact that we're proactive, strategic, 
and, and we have to say no to some so that we can say yes to others. So we're really at this great moment in time where we, have a, we still have a lot of work to do, um, and I think we're still early, but we, we, I think for, for the first time in the history of our city and our region, we actually have everybody, public and private, and institutional, because the universities are with us as well, all moving in the same direction. So the results, um, so, so my agency directly, since we implemented the strategy, we've, we've, we've directly assisted over 500 businesses. We put $75 million directly to work into those businesses. It's a variety of different forms. Some of it's, a lot of it's loans and grants and, some, and tax abatements. And we've leveraged that tenfold. And our, our programs have different types of leverage. So we have enterprise zone programs that have like 25 to one leverage. Some are one to one leverage. But all of our programs have some kind of leverage in them. Uh, but, but so not only is it positive outcome for us in terms of our work, but it, but it also reflects what's been going on in our economy. Um, in terms of the actual job creation, we track jobs in two ways. So the direct jobs, meaning the businesses that we help, we've touched about 42, 4,300 jobs. About two-thirds of those are new jobs that we've created, and you can see more of those have been through existing companies and startups, but we still engage in, in, in uh, selective recruitment activities. And then we also measure the jobs we retain, because that's an important part of why we provide assistance to our local business base. So this is the comp these are companies that we've worked with directly. Um, but then on a macro level, and I remember I mentioned to you we had a 10,000 uh, net new job goal over five years. Since the strategy was adopted over three and a half years ago, we've grown by almost 25,000 new jobs. I I'm not here up here taking credit for that. I, I, I mean, I think we've had a positive influence on the direction of the economy, but we, we are, the, the recovery is benefiting metro areas and metro areas like Portland in particular. Um, I think what we're doing is positioning our economy to catch on to that, to that train. Um, so I, I think we take credit for that. We're trying to, to make it more of a knowledge economy less dependent on, on cyclical industries but, and, 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 and more focused on trade. Um, but, but a lot of this is, is how the recovery is unfolding, which is you know, definitely benefiting metro areas at the expense of rural areas. And our unemployment rate has dropped significantly. We're now at about 7.3%. Um, uh, it still is too high uh, relative to historic levels, but it's come down a lot. And, and in, um, equally significant for us is you can't really tell from these lines, but we've always had an unemployment rate above the national average. We've never been below the national average until recently. So about a year ago, our lines crossed, and we're now below the national average in, in terms of unemployment. That's a sign for us that we are charting a different course. We used to go into recessions harder and come out later um, than the national economy, and I think we're actually finally changing that, that, that dynamic. And then we can show positive job gains which in each, within three, in three of the four clusters. So clean tech, software, and athletic and outdoor all have positive job gains. Um, still, some of them are small uh, industries, so the job numbers aren't, aren't, aren't dramatic. Um, but in advanced manufacturing, uh, for those of you who do spend a lot of time reading what comes out of Brookings, probably Brian and I do. I don't know who else in the room. But, but uh, this is a big focus of Brookings work, too. The, 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 the manufacturing in this, country, in this country really is undergoing a shift, and we're trying to, still trying to figure that out. We know that output's increasing in Portland, in the Portland region. We know that capital investment's up in the Portland region, but jobs are not up. So manufacturing's changed. Manufacturers use the recession to shed jobs, and they're not bringing the jobs back. They're, bringing, they're, they're making capital investments instead. So good story on one hand, but I think we got to figure out the job picture uh, for us. Um, we do have job opportunities, though, because of the aging workforce within manufacturer, within manufacturing. Most manufacturing around the country has, has an aging workforce, and so um, we, you know, we have to figure out how to replace those, those jobs. So my lessons, I'm, get, I'm getting the, the, the warning here, the time limit. Um, I've kind of gone through a lot of this. Um, having the strategy is critical. I, I think I've, I've, I've gone through that enough. Um, Smart strategy versus democratic one. Once again, I, I'm, I operate in a public and political environment. Uh, if we had gone the democratic route, we would have had, once again, 12 clusters, and we wouldn't have any prioritization. Um, I think you got to fight the battles early. 
get a strategy that works and get people upset early on and then, and then bring them back into the fold later on. Um, leadership has to own a strategy. So whatever the makeup of leadership is, and it's not just public, private leadership, you can't have the people in the trenches doing all this good work, but the folks up top are all carping on the strategy or not, are not willing to have your back when people complain about, about the one direction or another. And then, you know, once again, implementation matters. So strategy, this is one of the first strategies we've worked on that hasn't, hasn't sat on a shelf. We actually, every single day, we implement the strategy. And this is now three and a half years in. It truly is, I mean, I've 20 plus year career, public and private. I, I've, I've never been part of an effort in implementing a strategy that has been as disciplined as this. Um, it's, it's truly been gratifying to be able to, to, to not have to go back and say, well, this part of the strategy doesn't really matter anymore. Every single day we implement, we implement the strategy. And then, you know, as you heard up here, you know, particularly folks like us or JDC, we can have great ideas, we can be instigators and conveners, but ultimately the buy-in and the direction and ultimately the funding and things like that has to come from industry. So we continue to to push and pull, you know, we, we get people pissed off at us too. The push and pull between what we, you know, what we want to do and what industry wants to do happens all the time, but it's a healthy, healthy tension and sometimes you'll move really quick and you'll see a lot of progress. Other times it stalls, but you know, people are running businesses. They have lots of things to worry about. So sometimes it's not easy for someone to take time out of their busy private sector life to, to help organize a cluster. Um, so we recognize that, but ultimately, yeah, we, you all have to move together. You can't get out ahead of, of, um, of industry. So with that, did I leave time for questions? OK, all right. So thank you very much for, for listening to my presentation. Um, if you get tired of the rain, you can come visit us. You know, it's, it's like that all year round in Portland. Uh, <laughs> and we do have streetcars uh, as well, so. Um, Questions? Any questions? Does we have a mic? I'm not going to ask the question, so. I don't need a mic. Uh, no, we have, we're recording this, Kirby, so yes. And you don't have to sing, you just have to. Thank you. We're all four of these clusters developed at the same time, and are all or any of them considered mature clusters at this point? So when so we we did a, somewhat of a top down approach. So we picked the clusters all at the same time, um, but 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 they were all they were all at different. If you were to map out kind of the evolution of a cluster, they were all at different stages. So um, I would say the athletic and outdoor industry is we could probably walk away from it right now and be fine. Um, um, the software industry is having tremendous success, but but they are the most dependent on us in terms of our regular intervention. Um, like I said, there's so many questions about manufacturing that I, as I think we're going to be working with them collaboratively for a long time. And, and the, the clean tech industry, if someday, you know, the definition of clean tech changes all the time. So so they still all exist at different points, but we did pick them at a moment in time. We basically started here. And they were at different points at that time, and so they've moved. Um, they've all moved in the time, but but they started at different places. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Yes. Yeah, and we get when people say, "I want to be," you know, we, "we should have another cluster." One of my responses is, "Great, but I think we should stay at four. So which one is not going to be a cluster?" And I, and I would say the first one probably to take off the list is we should say they graduate is the right way to say it, so that they have this exalted title or something. Thank you. You mentioned creativity. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the link between creativity and innovation and how your organization decided that was important and how you uh, built the creativity capability within the ecosystem. Um, I, 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 we certainly can't take credit for, for, for bringing the creativity into the ecosystem. I mean, anybody who's read about Portland knows that we've attracted a, a lot of young creative people. Um, and then, and then industries like the athletic and outdoor industry are thrive on creativity. So they've attracted a lot of talent. Um, we certainly recognize in working in these industries that that creativity matters. It matters in software. It, it matters. I mean, it matters in all industries, but it's really explicit in places like software and athletic and outdoor and sometimes clean tech. 
So, you know, for us, it's, it's about, you know, I, I think we really buy into, even though quality, I didn't talk about quality of life after the beginning. Uh, quality of life is still the most important thing we have to, to, to maintain our creative talent because they want to be here. Um, uh, they want to be in our city because they like the city and because it is a place with a lot going on. We, you know, we basically build, we take from the Portland is weird and we go from there. So we, we don't fight that. That's actually a, one of our assets. We just, we, and we don't want to do anything to kill it because it's, it's a base of everything we do. Um, and we had to get people, to, the kind of old time business community to, to buy into that. Like you're fighting this, but this is really the future. So, so we start from the presumption that we have create, creative talent. Maybe someday we're, we're gonna take it for granted and we won't have it, but, but for now, you know, part of our challenge is if, how do we maximize this and get everyone else around the country to realize that this is where a lot of the creative talent is. Thanks for being with us. Sure. Would you give us uh, some feedback from what you've heard of the, our program so far? How are we doing? Are we on the right track? And are you called upon to give uh, messages like this often and in many places? Um, so I'll answer the, the, the second question first. Um, you know, we, we get invitations uh, a fair amount. Um, uh, yeah. So, you know, we, but we, you know, we don't, we don't, we don't take them all. Really, a lot of it's schedule dependent. But I have to say that, you know, um, this there was a personal appeal that, that Brian made that was really attractive to this about this. Um, uh, it's a bit, it's always busy for us. But, but I, I really was sold on his commitment to to this kind of work and this philosophy. And so, because I think we share so much in common in terms of our philosophy on this, I really felt like it was a good thing to do to come up here in, in addition to making my first trip to Alaska. Um, you know, I, I can't recite things off the top of my head. I, I, I actually, but I, I was impressed. I, I, you know, so, so I do think both the, for, the, 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 the structure of it, let me start from that. I said it once before, I'll say it again. The fact that, like, I don't know that I could do this. I don't know I could pull this off the way you guys did. Th this is huge. The engagement that you have here is, is a huge part of this whole process. I mean, think about, once again, the importance of strategy and alignment and setting priorities. You, you guys have got it. I mean, I, I don't know what goes on behind the scenes, but, uh, but you guys come up here and you guys uh, are able to articulate your priorities, um, and it's not, you know, staff doing it. Um, so, um, so that's incredibly impressive. And then I think there's a lot of substance um, behind it. I, 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 I guess I would encourage you to think about the marketing and promotional side of the cluster work uh, is I, I don't, maybe I missed it, but but it was um, I think you can get into the trenches and think about you know how do I improve the competitive advantage and and this and I think it's all good work, but but part of this is selling, it's really selling because you know I think I'm the clean tech capital of the world, but so do 20 other cities, and I think I can prove it, but they're they're at conferences telling everybody that the same thing I'm telling them. Right, so so at a certain point, you just gotta you gotta sell it like you believe it and like it's true, and and um, and so you know drop down into one of your industries, you gotta sell it like you know selling Juno as the place where the mining industry should take all this to helicopter I mean, repair. You know, there's an incredible logic to that, but I think that's a sales job. That is fundamentally a sales job. I mean, they can look at a map and see where Juno is relative to Vancouver. So I think there there's and, 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 and you got to have some first movers in that, like for, to, for that to, to happen. You're not going to make all this investment ahead of all the business happening. So I think somebody's got to sell the industry to take a risk on Juno as the place where that should happen because it makes so much sense. And then you over time. So there's this constant kind of selling, backing it up, selling, backing it up. And, and, and so I think you always have to keep that in mind that, that globally competitive economy you think you have the best four industries in these in these sectors? You got to sell that, in addition to actually doing the hard work. Thank you, Mr. Quinton. We have a few more questions, but I'm wondering whether you'd be open to speaking with people in the lobby because we have to get the yes, I'd we be, have to get be fine. Um, especially the woman from University of Alaska Southeast right there. She would love to chat with you a little more. So. Okay, thank you, everybody. <laughs>